How do we reconcile the traditional Christian perspective of light and dark, good and evil, with modern psychology? How do we make sense of these enormous ideas in our everyday lives? You're watching Archetypal Wisdom. Join me in exploring the universal truths and mysteries of humankind. Remember to like and subscribe. Now, back to the video. One thing that I have always struggled to personally reconcile within the traditional Christian perspective is this idea of ultimate good and ultimate evil. I don't mean that this idea of differentiated opposites doesn't make sense to me. However, I struggle to make sense of how this idea was being reconciled internally within individuals. I guess to put it simply, it concerned me that if the concepts of absolute good and absolute evil were externalized in such an extreme way, then how could it not lead to some form of internalized denial? As humans, it seems we are made of equally good and bad potential. With this in mind, if the individual must strive for the light of God, Christ, absolute good, and reject the dark of the devil, antichrist, absolute evil, how could this not lead to repression on some level? After all, if we are made up of both light and dark, but the dark is associated with absolute evil, then the odds of us developing a sophisticated way of dealing with it are slim. Most likely, we will intensely reject and repress it out of fear. In his book, Ion, Researches into the Phenomenology of the Self, Carl Jung states, if we see the traditional figure of Christ as a parallel to the psychic manifestation of the self, then the Antichrist would correspond to the shadow of the self, namely the dark half of human totality, which ought not to be judged too optimistically. So far as we can judge from experience, light and shadow are so evenly distributed in man's nature that his psychic totality appears to say the least of it in a somewhat murky light. This outlines the extreme split in the theology between good and evil, Christ and the Antichrist, that feels particularly challenging to reconcile within the psyche of an individual. I want to make it clear that my desire to understand this is a sincere one. I am genuinely seeking and I find this intersectional realm of religion and psychology a truly fascinating one. I believe that Jung did a remarkable job of unpacking the complexity of religious thought and expression and bridging the distance between its mystical and strange nature with the natural laws of psychology. It seems to me that there is a profound truth at the heart of religious ideas which is why they have existed for as long as they have. In fact, this is the idea of an archetype. Archetypes are essentially universal psychological instincts. They are represented and symbolized in mythologies and cultures across the entire globe. Jung observed their repeating patterns emerging across all different times and places, as well as spontaneously emerging in the dreams and episodes of psychosis of many patients. This led to the conclusion that these repeating themes and patterns were clearly emerging from the depths of the psyche at a level that appeared to be universal and shared. This was called the collective unconscious, which is the home of the archetypes. It is an inherently mysterious concept but in essence is some kind of substrate of our shared collective human experience and psychological inheritance. It is the entire blueprint of human psychology and it seems to sit at the very base of the psyche's structure. In the earlier quote from his book Ion, Jung mentioned the self. This is an archetype that in essence represents the totality of the psyche, both conscious and unconscious, and is often referred to as the archetype of archetypes. The self is often symbolized by the mandala in the sphere, images of wholeness. These symbols have emerged in many cultures for thousands of years and have been known to spontaneously emerge in episodes of psychosis when the psyche is experiencing great turbulence. What's fascinating about this is that it brings us to the image of the cross and the passion in Christianity. Because the cross makes up the center of a sphere or circle, broken into four quarters, in Matthew 10, 37, 38, and 39, Jesus states, Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. In the mysterious Gospel of Thomas, a gospel which dates back to the first century but was rejected and hidden from the Bible, Jesus, Yeshua, states, Whoever cannot free themselves from their father and their mother cannot become my disciple. Whoever cannot free themselves from their brother and their sister and does not bear their cross as I do is not worthy of me. I have often wondered what it really means to take your cross. I guess I always thought it meant to carry your load in life, to take on your responsibilities. I think in a sense it does mean this, however when we start to look at it through the lens of the self-archetype, it takes on a particularly curious meaning. 
Jung demonstrates this idea of the self using the cross in its formation of what he calls the Quaternion of Opposites. At the top of the cross he writes, unitemporal, at the bottom eternal, to the left unique, and to the right universal. He states the following, This formula expresses not only the psychological self, but also the dogmatic figure of Christ. As an historical personage, Christ is unitemporal and unique, as God universal and eternal. Likewise, the self, as the essence of individuality, it is unitemporal and unique. As an archetypal symbol, it is a God image, and therefore universal and eternal. He uses this same representation of the Quaternion of Opposites to outline the tension between light and dark, at the top of the cross writing good, at the bottom bad, left spiritual, and right material. Because the self represents the totality of the psyche, both conscious and unconscious, it also includes the shadow, the feared and repressed parts of the psyche. It is in this sense that it is an archetype of wholeness or completeness. He uses the cross to explain the ego's position in all of this, the ego being the conscious personality of the individual. The ego sits at the center of the cross, in a sense it is crucified between these opposing forces. In fact, at one point Jung says, this great symbol tells us that the progressive development and differentiation of consciousness leads to an ever more menacing awareness of the conflict and involves nothing less than a crucifixion of the ego, its agonizing suspension between irreconcilable opposites. From this perspective, the call to take up our crosses in order to be a disciple of Christ takes on a profound meaning. It seems that we must bear this unbelievable tension of opposites within our nature. In fact, this starts to correlate with the idea of ego death in spiritual circles as a form of enlightenment. Although Jung states clearly that one can't lose the ego completely, as that will lead to complete unconsciousness. Therefore, it seems that as one bears this tension of opposites at the center of the cross of the self, their ego is expanded to include more of the self archetype in conscious awareness. In other words, the ego goes through multiple deaths and rebirths as it expands and grows. This coalesces with other passages from the mystical Gospel of Thomas, when Yeshua speaks of entering the kingdom of heaven. His language is very spherical, stating that you must make the inner like the outer, and the high like the low. It seems this could potentially be understood as the ego at the center of the cross of the self, bearing the tension so that the individual may be united. I have a number of Christians in my life who are dear to me, and who I've had long conversations with trying to make sense of these matters. Understandably, some of them have had a hard time with this idea of integrating the shadow, because it seems to counter the idea of moving only towards the light. While I understand this, I also think it brings with it an important issue that needs to be contended with. The issue is the unconscious influence of the shadow on the individual. As mentioned earlier, the shadow is all the feared and repressed aspects of the psyche. The shadow by definition is within the unconscious of the individual. The problem with it remaining in the unconscious is that every individual is massively influenced by the unconscious. In fact, the more unconscious something is, the more influential it is over the individual. Hence the famous Jung quote, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. To take an example, let's say someone is afraid of their anger, and thus it is very repressed. Well, as long as the anger is repressed, it will emerge and erupt from the individual in a dysfunctional way. It will motivate their thoughts, behavior, and conversations. Just because their anger is repressed and out of sight does not cause it to cease to exist. Far from it. That energy of anger is roaming the unconscious looking for a place to go. Therefore, it will bleed out everywhere in an unhealthy way, perhaps in violent outbursts or passive-aggressive remarks and intentions. In essence, its dysfunctional expression will manifest in the form of sin. Whereas if the anger is integrated, then it can be brought under conscious control and directed towards a higher ideal or the light of God. For example, anger can be used to protect loved ones or to simply stand up for yourself and others. In fact, you could argue that the act of shining the light of consciousness on the shadow is in fact moving towards the light of God because you are diminishing the influence of the shadow and thus the manifestation of sin. In fact, looking at the self archetype, the idea of being made in the image of God starts to make more sense. With this in mind, Jung references St. Augustine, who was born in the third century and is one of the most influential figures in the development of Western Christianity and philosophy. Jung states, St. Augustine, 354 to 430, distinguishes between the God image, which is Christ, 
and the image which is implanted in man as a means or possibility of becoming like God. The God image is not in the corporal man, but the anima rationalis, the possession of which distinguishes man from animals. This infers that it is on the psychic plane that humans have this access to the divine, the divine spark of consciousness. But this also infers the process of development one must go through. This is because this divine spark is the ego consciousness, which is the differentiated sense of self. Yet it is this ego consciousness which must continue to grow and integrate more of the unconscious, thus becoming like God. As Jesus says, one must pick up their cross and follow his example. In fact, this painful process of development, the crucifixion of the ego and the cross of the self, seems to be essential if one is to actually follow Jesus. This adds more meaning to Jesus' statement, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Perhaps the loss of one's life is the sacrifice of the ego in order for the self to be realized. Surrendering one's familiar and comfortable conscious life to the great unknown and conflicting forces within forces the ego into a cycle of death and rebirth as part of development. To me, these two realms of existential theological ideas and modern psychological ones can indeed coexist. In fact, it seems that they actually circumambulate each other very naturally. You've been watching Archetypal Wisdom. Remember to like and subscribe. Stay wise.